Now, Sir Christopher clearly belongs to that group of persons who does not need an introduction, especially to this very distinguished audience. But please allow me the honor of making at least a brief introduction that certainly will not do credit to all he has accomplished. Indeed, his career in international law is rich, illustrious, and very influential. Uh, Sir Christopher served as a judge at the International Court of Justice for almost a decade, between 2009 and 2018. And this is a very busy period where some almost 30 cases, I believe, were on the docket uh, of the court covering a variety of issues. Um, and before his election to the court, he was professor of international law at the London School of Economics. He served as counsel for the United Kingdom government on many cases, appearing regularly before the ICJ, European Court of Human Rights, English courts, and many other tribunals. And as I understand, he's currently master at Modulin College, I hope I pronounced that correctly. So without question, Sir Christopher is someone who can speak with much depth and authority on the very thought-provoking, may I say extremely relevant topic of the future of international law in uncertain time. Now, I would also like to introduce our moderator, uh, and that is Dr. Tara Davenport, who herself is a rising star of international law for her generation, uh, having already established uh, her reputation as a leading scholar in international law, and in particular, law of the sea. She is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law the National University of Singapore, a senior research fellow at the Center for International Law, and also deputy director of the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law. And I have to add that Tara has four law degrees <laughs> <laughs> from the London School of Economics. So I know you'll talk a little bit about your paths have crossed. Uh, LLM uh, from NUS in Maritime Law, and an LLM and JSD uh, from Yale Law School. So today we have the great pleasure of Tara being our moderator. So if I may... Yeah, well, Professor, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, and my grateful thanks to everyone here at the Center for International Law, the National University of Singapore, uh, and uh, Maxwell Chambers for inviting me to come and speak here this evening. Um, it is very good indeed to be back in Singapore and very good to be back anywhere where I don't have to do something with Zoom. Um, it had got to the stage after my first year as Master of the College where if I couldn't hear what somebody was saying in face-to-face -face conversation, I found my finger was reaching out for an imaginary keyboard to try and turn the sound up. Um, as has just been mentioned, I, I spent much of my childhood in Singapore and it's lovely to be back. I was asked, what changes do I notice? Well, there are many, but the one that I really notice is that when I first came here, a pound bought $8.56 to Singapore. <laughs> but now my main concern is whether the money I brought with me is going to pay my taxi fare back to the airport. <laughs> now, the subject for tonight is the future of international law in an uncertain time. And it would be difficult not to highlight the contrast with the way we felt about international law when I gave previous lectures out here in 2004 at the Attorney General's Chambers and 2013 at SMU. That was a period of considerable optimism about international law. Look at the situation today and it really doesn't look anything like as good. There are undoubtedly major reasons for concern. The bloodshed in the Ukraine, Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, which challenges both the international law of the Charter and also the rules of international law on humanitarian affairs, on refugees, on prisoners of war, 
on torture. But the issues go wider than that. In addition to those obvious headline-grabbing events, you have other serious challenges to international law today. The fact that the World Trade Organization appellate system has been paralyzed for so long because of the refusal to confirm or reconfirm members in office. The fact that the British government has an attorney general who at one stage described the government as proposing a limited and specific breach of international law. Whether the adjectives limited and specific make it any better is, I think, seriously open to question. And you have an attack on basic institutions of international law from several different directions. You hear, for example, from some critics that human rights courts and tribunals are seriously overreaching themselves, that here you have unelected foreign judges telling a sovereign country what it should do. The very same people object vehemently to the criticism from another part of the international legal community that investor state arbitration involves unelected foreign judges telling a sovereign state what to do. The two groups who make those criticisms have, as they would see it, no interests in common at all. They are diametrically opposed to each other. Yet each of them is attacking a bit of international law that it doesn't like and is using exactly the same argument as the other group with which to attack it. So perhaps the title I should have chosen is not the future of international law, but is there a future for international law in these uncertain times? Now from time to time when I give a lecture, I get asked if somebody could have my text afterwards. Um, my text usually consists of a few scribblings, which are a bit of an embarrassment because even I can't read them because I'm too vain to wear my reading glasses when I'm lecturing. Um, but it reminds me of a lecturer in English at Cambridge who was once asked for the text of a brilliant lecture he'd given. And he fished in his pocket, produced an old envelope, and it said, Hamlet, Shakespeare, tragedy, question mark. <laughs> so perhaps my text for tonight should be international law, tragedy, question mark. <laughs> well, there's certainly reason for concern but I don't think there's reason to despair about the future of international law. I think to understand why, we need a sense of proportion, a sense of perspective, and a sense of humility. And I'd like to elaborate a little bit on each of those and then suggest one or two ways in which the current situation might be improved. Let's take, first of all, the question of a sense of proportion. You can always find signs of decline if you pick the right period with which to compare what is happening today. And if you compare what is happening today in international affairs with what was happening a decade or two ago, it definitely looks rather bleak. But if you go back two or three decades before that, the comparison suddenly becomes rather different. If you compare, for example, the attitude of the international community today towards what's happening in Ukraine, towards what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Myanmar, with the attitude towards breaches of international law in the wars in the Middle East, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in the other conflicts <coughs> of the 60s and the 70s, the comparison looks nothing like as bad. If you go back to the international reaction at the time, to the genocide in Rwanda. I shall never forget sitting in a hotel room in Washington on my way to the American Society of International Law Annual Conference and watching horrific footage on CNN <coughs> of the massacres in Rwanda, something which far eclipses anything we're getting on the television sets at the moment. But worst of all, running along the bottom were all these statistics, which I thought to start with were an indication of how many people were being killed that turned out to be the baseball scores that weekend. What happened about Rwanda? The answer is that the international community did very little 
until after the event. Or if you look at the situation of the Cold War and the concept of mutual assured destruction, there was no real effort to grapple with that in terms of international law. Look at the institutions of international law four decades ago. The International Court of Justice was completely moribund when I was a student. It had one case on its books. In 1977, the year in which I took my LLM, the volume of reports for the, that, the International Court of that year was four pages long. Two pages in English and two pages in French saying the same thing. And in the set that I was given when I went to the International Court, that volume had a little notice in the back of the hardbound copy saying, this volume contains neither an index nor a table of contents, underneath which a previous judge had written in pencil, nor anything else. <laughs> <laughs> the situation with international arbitration was very much the same. There had been an arbitration award of stunning intellectual talent in the case involving the Beagle Channel. It dealt comprehensively with the legal dispute between Argentina and Chile, and did so in a way that did not satisfy either government, as a result of which they went to the brink of war within weeks of the award being published. And the situation was only saved from disaster by the Pope stepping in and offering papal mediation, to the consternation of the Vatican Secretary of State, because there hadn't been a papal mediation for 150 years, and they had very few records about how it was supposed to be done. So if we go back a little bit further in history, the current state of international law doesn't look anything like so bad. If you take, for example, the reaction to an illegal use of force today, not in itself a substitute for there not being an illegal result to force in the first place, but look at the reaction that there has been in the international community in the last year or two to illegal results to force. At least it's not ignored any longer. And a state pays a price if it invades its neighbours against, it, against the strictures of the Charter. Look at the reaction to the allegations of genocide in Myanmar, the case in the International Court of Justice there, and the fact that so many states are now seeking to intervene in those proceedings, rather than simply treating it as a problem for somebody else. And look at what is perhaps one of the greatest success stories of international Although whenever I talk about the law of the sea, the first question I usually get asked, in Britain at least, is, so why has China ignored the South China Sea's arbitration award? There are two points about that. The first is China hasn't ignored the South China Sea's arbitration award. The first thing most Chinese international lawyers will talk to you about is the South China Sea's award. And they've gone to great lengths to try and show why it's, in their view, it's wrong. But secondly, it's an isolated case. Virtually all of the other maritime boundary disputes in international affairs have been resolved peacefully, either through judgments of a court or arbitration courts, or by means of negotiation. What could have been at the equivalent of the 19th century scramble for Africa, with states falling over themselves to lodge competing claims, with all the risk of that escalating into violence at sea, has for the most part been resolved extraordinarily peacefully. And lastly, what about the institutions? The International Court of Justice does at least have work to do these days, and it's doing it very effectively. Robert Jennings, who was one of my predecessors as a British judge on the court, used to say every judgment the court has ever given has been complied with then pause and add, eventually. Um, sometimes eventually was a matter of 40 years, but they, he was right, the judgments were complied with. You couldn't say that at the moment. And certainly the record of compliance with provisional measures orders is not very good at all. But with the judgments themselves, it's still not bad. And they are churned, being churned out by the court at the rate of four or five a year, instead of one a decade in the 1970s. It's also worth looking to see who takes part in cases in the international court. Nearly half the states in the world have now been parties to a contentious case, and more than half 
have taken part in proceedings in one capacity or another, including countries like China, which historically had shown no interest in the International Court of Justice at all, appearing more recently in two of the advisory opinion proceedings. Look at the creation of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which most of us back in the 1990s thought was going to be the biggest white elephant the UN had created, where it would have to be said the competition was fierce. In the end, the ICTY managed to obtain custody of every defendant it indicted. It conducted trials which get the ultimate accolade of having been criticized almost equally and on the same grounds by people from all three main parties in the fighting of the four years. It has, I think, laid the ground for an international criminal law that can work. Rather more successfully, it has to be said, than the International Criminal Court itself has done so far. So while the situation is very far from good at the moment, if we have a proper sense of proportion, it's nothing like as bad as it was at one time. In the words of a, a black preacher from the southern USA in the 1970s, we're not where we ought to be, we're not where we're going to be, but thank God we're not where we were. And I think international lawyers are in a position to say that as they look at the situation. That's the sense of proportion. Now let me say a bit about a sense of perspective. Law is not something which exists in the abstract. It takes its effect within a society framework. And it is only as strong as the society in which it operates. At least over a period of years, it won't be stronger than the society in which it operates. An international society is unbelievably weak. There is an inequality of wealth and power, political, military, diplomatic, in international society, which far exceeds anything you'll find within even the most unequal of domestic states, domestic societies. In the old days, the British Navy used to be proud of what it called the two power staff. The Royal Navy would be larger than the two next largest navies in the world combined. The US armed forces are larger and better resourced than the next 10 states in the world. The difference in economic power between one of the G7 and a state the size of Nauru eclipses anything you'll get in any domestic state. Secondly, there is a complete weakness of central institutions in international society. Although we sometimes talk about the UN as a world government or a world legislature, that's a complete myth. It's nothing of the kind. The General Assembly, the Security Council, the International Court of Justice lack any of the resources that the executive, the legislature, and the courts possess in virtually any domestic state. And there is also the problem of legitimacy. And I think that is something that international lawyers have rather tended to shy away from. We talk about those who criticize international law and globalism as being a bunch of populists, of nationalist bigots. But in fact, if you come from a society where there is a powerful democracy, where you elect your government, where your parliament is accountable to the people, then somehow the idea of the treaty-making process being used as a way of getting round, as it's often seen, the decisions of a domestic parliament, may not appear to have quite the legitimacy that we would like. So international law doesn't have the power with which to coerce that you get in most states. And equally, it doesn't have that bedrock of public support and sympathy, which enable it to achieve its goals by reason and by explanation, rather than through enforcement. Now, I want to make no bones about it. I'm not suggesting for a minute that international law is fatally flawed. I don't believe that the populist backlash against international law is justified. All I'm saying is that it's a fact. And it's that which is the weakness, rather than the legal system itself. We talk with great enthusiasm about a rules-based international order. It's one of the phrases that has come into vogue in the last five or six years. Phrases like this tend to become popular 
at exactly the wrong moment. Um, they start being used extensively just at the time when a rules-based international order is most difficult to detect. But the point is, it's a rather good idea and a rather dangerous phrase if you examine it. The first is that no society is entirely rules-based, nor, frankly, should it be. There should be room for politics. There should be room for debate. There should be room for all the machinations and backstage maneuverings that you get in any democratic society, and indeed in any undemocratic society. It shouldn't always be a matter for the lawyers to rule upon. And secondly, when we talk about rules-based, I think we're oversimplifying. It's not just a matter of rules. It's a matter of much more. It's a matter of principles. It's a matter of institutions the institutions which you need to interpret, apply, and enforce any rules or principles that you're dealing with. Now, those institutions are critical, and in international law, they're particularly weak. No system of compulsory judicial settlement. Relatively little in the way of compulsory recourse to arbitration, although much more than there was when I was a student. And this is significant because one of the advantages of a dispute going, a dispute about a point of law going to a court or to an arbitration tribunal is that it isolates that dispute from the broader framework of relations between the parties. One of the reasons why this is unpopular with some governments is that once you take, for example, a trade dispute out of the realm of politics, and slot it into the world of the WTO and GATT, suddenly the more powerful state loses much of the leverage that it would have in ordinary negotiations against the For example, um, if you call your mind back to the Rainbow Warrior case in the 1980s, Rainbow Warrior, some of you might remember, was a Greenpeace ship that was blown up in a harbour in New Zealand by a group of agents from the French Secret Service because it was getting in the way of French nuclear testing in the South Pacific. A photographer was killed in the course of the explosion. Two of the French agents in question, who were posing as a married couple, were doing it very effectively because they hated each other, and that was very obvious. Um, two of them were caught, tried in New Zealand, and given sentences of 10 years. They were later released under a deal between France and New Zealand, which had been brokered by the UN Secretary General. That brokerage, of course, had a lot to do with the fact that New Zealand's license to import butter into the European Union, which was a vital part of the New Zealand economy, was just coming up for renewal and could be renewed only by unanimous decision of the then member states of the European Union. One of the advantages of law is that you can isolate the legal dispute and stop other political considerations being brought to bear. But the very fact you can do that is something which causes concern to many governments. If you look at what the United States government has said in the present administration about the appellate body of the WTO, I think you'll detect strong signs of that, a desire to try and move back to a world of negotiation in which, of course, the world's largest economy as a particularly strong position. And lastly, anything that we might call a rules-based order depends upon the rules and the institutions which enforce them, having a degree of legitimacy with the people who are subject to them. That is becoming more and more difficult, and it's something which I think international lawyers have a tendency to shy away from. Not surprisingly, we know that we're wonderful. We know that what we do is worthwhile. We know that we can save the world with it. Well, perhaps. But I think we should be a little bit less ready, first of all, to assume that everybody else will take for granted the values that we adhere to. Look, for example, in federal states at the way in which treaty making on matters like human rights and the environment has affected the balance of power under a constitution between the Federation and the states, subject to a particular controversy in the High Court of Australia. And while 
the public will generally accept the legitimacy of international law norms relating to matters which obviously require international cooperation. Air services agreements, for example. Most of the time, they'll go along with diplomatic immunity, although what they really like is the immunity for their diplomats overseas, but not for other people's diplomats who commit a wrong on their territory. But they are, I think, much less easy to convince about the value of international law rules which change the economic balance of power, which might mean that people lose their jobs when their factory closes, that affect questions such as whether you can deport a foreign national who's been convicted of murder after they've served their sentence. And if we are going to take the view as international lawyers that these are matters worthy of international regulation, I think we have to be prepared to explain why and to show how it fits within concepts of democratic governance. The other problem I would uh, wish to point out in terms of a sense of perspective is I think as international lawyers we've been a touch too ready to jump to the assumption that one or two minor changes will sort everything out for us. For four years, the number of articles I read in Britain and America, the gist of which was, as soon as we've got rid of President Trump, everything's going to be all right, are I think not really borne out by the state of international law two years after President Trump lost office. I make no comment whatsoever about whether he actually lost office or it was taken from. I think that's a matter for somebody else to deal with. So, a certain amount of perspective about where international law fits into a broader picture would help. And then thirdly, there's the sense of humility. Now, this is a realization of exactly what international law can and cannot achieve. And the answer is that it can never achieve a lot of the things that we might like it to do. You can no more solve the problems of climate change by law then you can solve the problems of violence by having a murder statute. It requires very much more than that. All that we can effectively do is to help provide the means by which change can be effected. Climate change can only be practically addressed through a political and economic process, a willingness on the part of everyone turn the air conditioning up or down, I never can remember which way it's supposed to be put, to wear a jumper in Britain during winter, not to drive your car at 90 miles an hour for 100,000 miles in a year, and a willingness on the part of governments to face up to the sacrifices that addressing climate change is going to require. Once that willingness is there, then you can put in place the legal mechanism to help make it work. But simply legislating, adopting treaties, by itself doesn't achieve anything at all. And indeed, one of the areas where I think we have been particularly weak as an international legal community is the assumption that the more treaties we adopt, the more progress we're making. By itself, another treaty doesn't make any difference at all. It only makes a difference if it actually affects the human conduct, affects the conduct of governments. And sometimes, extra legislation can actually make things worse. Let me give you an example of something that didn't actually come about, but very nearly did. Back in the 1980s, there was a large campaign to amend the Geneva Conventions on the Laws of War, to make it clear that rape was a grave breach of those conventions. It doesn't appear by name in the list of grave breaches, because back in 1949, they didn't like using words like that, and they hedged their bets in various ways. Now, supposing that that had been taken further, supposing that a treaty had been signed, which made rape an identified grave breach, and then 25 years later, only 30 states out of nearly 200 have ratified that treaty, what is the position of the other 170? All you succeed in doing is undermining the argument that the existing law covers rape, even though it doesn't actually use the word itself. And I think we need to look much more closely at what can be achieved within the framework of existing treaties, existing rules of international law, to strengthen the means of compliance with them, rather than focusing all the time on some eye-catching new treaty initiative. 
trouble is, it's a little bit like telling a PhD student that the best thing to do is to write a piece about how the existing system works relatively well and twitch it in a few ways and it'll be fine. You don't get your PhD for writing that. You get your PhD for writing something that says, this is an entirely new phenomenon, the existing law doesn't cope with it, we need something completely new as the means of addressing it. But perhaps that, the fact that that's how you get a doctorate is not necessarily indicative of how we should try to govern the world. So what I would suggest is this, that if international law is to have a thriving future, we need to be a bit more pragmatic. We need to be more focused on making the law work, and less focused on making more law. And above all, we need to focus on how to explain why international law is worthwhile to our electorates, to our politicians, to the military, to all those who happen to be most affected by it. And that's why, in my view, we can say there is a future for international law and not just fall back on a rather cynical approach. Cynicism tends to be the first refuge of the intellectually lazy. Uh, anyone who's taught international law will, I'm sure, have been confronted with a student who stands up at the beginning of the course and says, doesn't really exist, does it? The late Sir Ian Brownlee, who acted for Singapore so successfully in the Petrobranca case, used to reply to that question by saying, you ask my bank manager, he'll tell you. <laughs> I fear my bank manager might put his punches a little bit more than Ian Brownlee's would have done on that subject. But the reality is, international law is something that states use. It's something that states talk about. It's not always something that states comply with. But if it is to be made to work properly, then we have to ensure that it is a system that is capable of being made to work and capable of persuading people that it is worth putting time and energy into, worth accepting the downsides in terms, for example, of the effect on your own domestic industries, because globalism and free trade benefits a wider public, that it's something that is worth applying in terms of human rights law, that the protection that is afforded to all states by Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter is worth putting up with the fact that you can't necessarily resort to armed force on the occasion when it would be most convenient. If we can do that, then I think we can make an international law that has a future and a future that is worthwhile. But it is a future that is going to have to be fought for. It's not something which we can take for granted in the way in which I think we were inclined to take for granted. And I put my hand up as one of those who perhaps was too ready to do so in the decades when everything was going smooth. Thank you all very much. <laughs>